So we're going to move straight then into the, the first session um, on uh, key issues in the green industrialization. Um, we, we have uh, three speakers, uh, Rob Davies, um, John Matthews, and uh, Faisal Ishmael. Um, I'm not going to... Okay. Um, I'm not going to give uh, detailed uh, introductions of them because they've just uh, introduced uh, themselves and, and told you a bit about their, their research. Uh, Rob's introduction, I think, was, was a bit modest. He didn't uh, also mention that he's the previous Minister of Trade and Industry in, in, in South Africa, um, who's sort of driving uh, many of these at the, the national and, and international level. Um, but uh, apart from that, I'm not going to recap their, their introductions. Let's go straight into the next uh, session. Um, so, uh, Rob, would you like to, to come up here and then we'll connect with uh, John and Faisal uh, virtually? I'll just press which. I'll turn to this one to change no, the slide. It's, it's already on the page. Yeah, but to change the slide. This one, eh? Okay. All right. This one changes the slide. That's fine. That's fine. Yeah. Okay. Well, thanks. Uh, thanks very much, uh, Fiona. Um, I'm going to to present. I think it's really like a, a political economy overview and probably a, a scene setter for I think many of the more uh, I think detailed presentations we're likely to get. Uh, but I want to just say that um, the thesis I'm going to put forward is that what we're on track for is an accelerated transition to a lower carbon economy. Um, and uh, I think this has got some technological dimensions to it, the introduction, introduction of new uh, technologies like uh, green energy and things like that. But it's also bringing with it other things like carbon trading systems, which I think are really quite problematic. Um, but uh, a whole lot of other features that go along with this. And I want to kind of make the point that uh, this is going to impact on African economies in ways beyond the nationally determined contributions that we've all been making uh, into the COP processes. Uh, and this is going to happen in various ways. I also want to address briefly some of the trade policy challenges, because I don't think they're more they're opportunities. I think they're more in the realm of challenges. But the background, obviously, is that... Uh, the world is facing the threat of catastrophic climate change. I've got a few details down there. But I think the, the, the one I really want to focus on is the United Nations Environmental Program report that was uh, issued just before this recent COP, the one that's now in progress, uh, on the uh, um, emissions gap report, uh, which basically said that uh, at the moment, even taking account of Glasgow, uh, we are not on track. There's no credible pathway in, in, in existence to contain uh, climate change, uh, the, uh, the, the global warming, uh, to uh, 1.5 degrees. So I think that uh, um, I want to make that point because I think that uh, we are also facing a huge adaptation issue, and that adaptation issue also requires an industrial response. Um, and I also want to make that point because I think that the adaptation is not attracting any international funding. It's all around mitigation. So um, that's the point I wanted to make and say that uh, the decisions that are taken and what's happening now is taking us into, you know, the, 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 the processes are taking us beyond uh, what we are committing ourselves to uh, in our national uh, um, uh, um, uh, 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 contributions. So I'm just saying that, you know, just give a few examples that if you are phasing down coal worldwide, uh, even if uh, you yourself are, are, are making a national commitment to do it more slowly, the fact of the matter is if you're a coal exporter like South Africa uh, and other countries are not going to be buying your coal, you're going to be affected by that. Uh, and that the, the net zero commitments by the developed world by 2030 uh, are, are leading to more pressure on trading partners to show that their exports are produced through lower uh, carbon processes, including the, the electricity that's used in their generation. And so um, I, I will come and, and, and critique measures like carbon border adjustment mechanisms later on. But I think we also need to take account of, uh, in addition to the 
a governmental action that may take place. There'll also be action by private buyers uh, and and uh, private standards in which uh, uh, green uh, uh, credentials will be part of this uh, will be important. And then uh, the point I mentioned earlier on this uh, emissions trading system. Uh, you know, a lot of the net zero is not going to be actual reduction of carbon. It's going to be uh, you're going to buy an offset. Uh, and some of those offsets are really quite problematic, but the submissions trading system is, is in place. Uh, there's a, a, an industry in place uh, around uh, the submissions trading system. Uh, and I think that uh, it's likely to be expanded. It's likely to be uh, uh, strengthened as well. So developing countries, are they, you know, I'm making the point, are likely to be affected beyond the common but differentiated national determined Con commitments that we've agreed to through the UN uh, FCCC processes. Then I want to just say, and I think this is the point, even if we contain the, uh, the rise in temperature to 1.5 degrees, and I see actually now at the COP, there's some countries that are beginning to say, let's not even set that as a target any longer. Uh, and even if it is a target, are the actions going to lead to that? I think that's a real question. They may well not. But, but you know, yeah, if they, they even if they, they did, we are going, going to be faced with a, with extreme weather events of one sort or another, which are going to be extremely damaging uh, to our countries. And I'll come to Africa in a moment. But uh, the uh, uh, if, of course, we don't contain it, uh, and the UN uh, Environmental Program report said we're on track, even with uh, our commitments in place for 2.4 degrees by the end of the century. That's going to be very, very significant extreme weather events, which are going to be extremely damaging uh, to, uh, to our countries. So um, actually, the IPCC report on Africa gives a very detailed region by region account of, of what's, what's going to happen. In many areas, there will be more irregular and reduced precipitation. Uh, and actually, you know, they, they also, the point's been made that the threat of climate refugees is not something for Africa in the future. It's happening already. It may not be across borders, but it's certainly happening people moving to cities because uh, many areas are facing more irregular precipitation desertification. Uh, droughts, fires, ecosystem degradation, all of these things are there. In other areas, there's storm cyclones, uh, pluvial flooding. And then coastal areas will be affected by rising sea levels. Well worth looking at that report. And you can see what can happen in your area as it breaks it down. So Africa, which is the least responsible for climate change, will be among the regions that are most affected by it. In fact, for South Africa, by the way, um, uh, the, the, the rule of thumb is that whatever the average global rise in temperature, we, we, we'll, get, we'll get double that. So if it's 2.4 degrees, we'll get 4.8 degrees. Six degrees means the country is pretty much uninhabitable. Uh, so that's, uh, that's kind of the scenario. So I want to say that all of this, this transition to the lower carbon economy and the transition which will impact on us beyond what we're committing to, is taking place in a, a system that's enmeshed in multiple crises. Uh, you know, we didn't even recover from COVID. And now we're hit by the, uh, the, the, the whole issue of inflation, stagflation. Uh, we, we've seen that uh, um, uh, all of this is, is happening in a world that is, is increasingly dividing into, into uh, you know, it's becoming more unequal. And I think that there's a, a huge potential, we need to understand the huge potential from our just transition. The just transition is not the default scenario. The, 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 the default scenario is a highly unjust transition. Uh, and I think that uh, there will inevitably lo be losers as well as winners. And if you decommission uh, activities, I think in South Africa, it's not necessarily the case that the people who have got jobs in the coal industry are going to be the ones who are most uh, fit and able to take on the jobs that are going to be created in, in, in other uh, low uh, carbon activities. So without a purposeful intervention programs at scale, I think that there's no guarantee uh, that the transition will, uh, will, will, will happen uh, in a just way. Uh, and so um, I think that, uh, you know, we, 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 we're going to need programs at scale. I'm just making that point about national programs. But um, 
While many of these uh, programs will necessarily have to be implemented at national level uh, and should be supported uh, according to principles like polluter pays uh, and so on, should be supported by real resource transfers from the developed world. And I'll come to those in a minute because I think that's not what we see. Uh, uh, and recompense for loss and damage, which is an issue in the COP27 right now. Um, I think we also need to move beyond the idea of a just transition as a series of national programs. And certainly we shouldn't be seeing this as, as, as merely kind of, uh, as it were, maintaining the status quo. I think that, that uh, our vision of a just transition has got to move into addressing key structural and transformative issues that are common to the developing world and the continent as a whole. So I think this is where, we, this is where we've really got to go uh, in this context. And I think that that means that Africa needs to embrace a vision of a transition to a low carbon economy that supports structural transformation, development and inclusivity, and that this means we need to move into higher value added activities, we need to support industrialization, and we need to realize the potential of something like the continental free trade area as a, as a tool of, of building regional value chains uh, that could uh, be central uh, to all of this. Now, I'm, I don't think I need to go through this slide. I'm just making the point that uh, the real reason why um, our, our countries remain underdeveloped is that we are trapped as producers and exporters of primary products. We are not involved in the production of value-added products, and that any developing country that has moved from uh, you know, poor to moderately prosperous or whatever uh, has passed through a stage of industrialization. So I think that what this means is that in this whole debate and discussion, Africa's right to industrialize and to pursue developmental regionalization must be acknowledged and promoted in, in some sort of a global Green New Deal that ultimately needs to underpin a developmental and inclusive transition to a lower carbon economy. So um, I think that um, uh, this transition, as I've said already, new technologies, green industrialization, and increasing competition based on green credentials. So it's going to be an element of, of comp competitiveness that you're going to have to show your green credentials. And if you can't show your green credentials, you're going to get uh, uh, you know, uh, disadvantaged uh, in the game. So I think the key question then is, will the developing world, including Africa, be able to share in the opportunities created by green industrialization, or are we just going to be once again relegated, relegated to the role of consumers of products of green industrialization produced elsewhere? But I want to add this point, buttressed by unfair trading practices, because I want to come to some of those in a minute. So that's the first point about the green industrialization. But the second point is the point I'm making now, the extreme weather events that we're going to face. And uh, really what we need is that uh, we need to be building more resilient communities and more resilient infrastructure against future extreme uh, uh, weather emergencies. You know, uh, we've had two lots of floods in KwaZulu-Natal in South Africa. Uh, when I first joined government, which would have been something like 2005, around about that time, I started to learn that climate science was telling us that the western part of South Africa would become dry and desertified, the eastern part would become more stormy. But we've done nothing about it proactively. We wait for the storms, then we have to fix up, fix up the damage, and in the meantime, people lose incomes, uh, people lose lives, people lose their homes. And I think that, that there's a, a, a real imperative uh, for us to, to actually act proactively uh, to defend our infrastructure based on the climate science. What does the climate science tell us that this municipality is going to face? What kind of threat is it? How do we, how do we work around it? And can we build public employment and other programs built around that? And I think that, uh, you know, we can learn from the experience of COVID-19. Massive underpreparedness and vulnerability on imported supplies. We need to be actually producing uh, all kinds of, of, of inputs into social and, in, and, and, and economic infrastructure uh, for a massive program of climate proofing uh, our, uh, our infrastructure. And so I think if we don't act proactively, 
uh, we're going to have to deal with it after the event when the deaths and the damage have been caused. That's the choice before us. So um, now I'm moving into a green industries. Uh, it should be RVC, regional value chain. Now, um, Carlos Lopez and, uh, and Dirk uh, uh, Tefelder, they, they said that there's a, a big opportunity for Africa um, because although uh, some reports have said that Africa's industries, current industries are actually uh, fairly high emitters, the fact of the matter is, is that the real challenge for industrialization in Africa is building something for the future. It's not really defending the existing base. And, and I think that uh, we have an opportunity as sort of newcomers or latecomers, uh, we have an opportunity to, to, to industrialize uh, from scratch with green technologies and green solutions. And we do have uh, areas where we could perhaps be uh, important uh, 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 niches and global leaders uh, in, for example, green hydrogen uh, and things like that. But I think we'll be potentially significant in using some of our mineral bases. Now, I think there are some initiatives underway at national levels. I'm aware of uh, there's, there's a master plan under, under development in South Africa around inputs into renewable energy. Um, but regional cooperation projects on renewable energy that I'm aware of are all about things like... Uh, taking advantage of the different time zones of different partners in regions so that you can, uh, you know, uh, have solar energy beyond uh, uh, the hours of, uh, of, of darkness in, 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 uh, in some countries generated in other parts of the, of the region that have still got sunlight, that sort of thing. Uh, it's not anything to do with, with manufacturing uh, of equipment. And yet, uh, this transition, uh, will, there will be a, a significant investment required if we are going to have uh, green energy in, in South Africa. So uh, IRENA, um, it estimates that providing sustainable and, re and reliable energy to the continent will require a doubling of investment in energy from $30 billion a year to currently to between 40 and 65 billion by 2030. So there'd be a significant procurement of equipment around green energy. Uh, and and um, so the question is, is this procurement going to go to buy wind towers, uh, solar panels, uh, all of the uh, uh, equipment? Is it going to go to, to, to buy these from abroad? Or is it going to support the development of industries in our own continent that are producing these? And I want to say also that I think that if we want to take advantage of the renewable energy that is perhaps where we have a bit of a competitive advantage. I'm thinking of things like platinum catalysts in hydrogen fuel cells uh, for small power stations, underground mining vehicles, public transport vehicles, and things like that. And also, uh, which uh, when I read some of the IRENA reports, they talk about modern renewable energy discounting where we have a huge advantage, which is uh, hydropower. Um, building hydropower. I mean, I think if we can get this, uh, we all know this, if we can get this Inga Falls off the ground, uh, this, is, this is literally a game changer. Uh, and this is uh, hydropower. Uh, and if we're going to build uh, capacities around that, I think these are more likely if we've got a kind of a, a value chain or an ecosystem that is building the technologies for renewable energy than if we're simply buying all the stuff, importing it all uh, from, from, from elsewhere. And so I think this is a, this is this is a, a critically important thing when we come on to the the trade policy issues. And then I'm making a similar point about climate proofing. Um, well, we we need to uh, you know some of this some of this is going to be national level, but some of this. What about all the PETA projects across the continent? Developmental in, uh, regionalism talks about the reason why we have so little. Uh, intra-regional trade is also because we the infrastructure is is all geared towards moving raw materials out of the continent, not to uh, intra-trade within the continent. And so PIDA is a program for, in, uh, for infrastructure development in Africa. It's an AU program. Uh, uh, and and, and, and all is, is, are, are all these projects, are these, are these uh, climate-proofed or not? Uh, so again, I think there's uh, significant inputs that will be required. And again, the question is, are they just going to be imported uh, or are we going to be developing uh, local capacities? Now, um, 
These are some of the issues I think are important. So Africa must be acknowledged as one of the regions that was most affected by climate change, even though it's the least role in creating it. That's, that's the reality of Africa. The developed world, I think it's important that we do insist that the developed world must accept obligations in accordance with the principles of common and dif but differentiated responsibility and polluter pays, those, those, those two principles. But I think that, um, you know, that should lead to real resource transfers. How would we measure that? Actually investments in building productive capacity or uh, transfers of, of, of funding. But what are we going to get? I think is going to be uh, something a little different. So loss or damage has been, you know, was, uh, was supposed to be dealt with in COP26. I see now COP27, a couple of small commitments to loss and damage, but nothing really significant. And um, I think that the same with this question of, 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 of finance. Um, the demand that we need to put for clean resource transfers is just legitimate, needs to be pursued. But actually, and I think this is what uh, uh, um, Busani would have given us, because uh, I saw a paper that they did uh, looking at the South African plan. Uh, what we get is not that. We get a package which has got a quantity to it, but that package is actually a discounted foreign loan. The transfer from abroad is the difference between the interest rate that we are paying and the interest rate we would pay if we had to go direct, uh, if they were willing to see us. Uh, and um, it's, not the, it's not the capital value which you have to pay back. But that's what you're getting. That's what you're getting offered. The second thing you're getting offered is we can help you to raise capital in the private markets, but but how? By de-risking, and de-risking means you offer extensive guarantees, not just against default, but also you guarantee high profits, high returns. I think we've seen that these kind of things called blended finance tend to be a um, a, a disappointment. Uh, high cost, low yield outcomes. That's what we. That's what we get it offered. That's what we get it offered. And Ukraine reconstruction is all the people in the banks, development finance institutions, will tell us any resources there are going there. It's not. It's not coming our way. So I think that's the that's the issue. So I think that this places a premium on demands, policy demands related to structural transformation and industrial policy. If we you know, we're not going to get finance that's going to meet the bill. We're going to have to industrialize. And I think that in any case, this is central to this is the central vision. I mean, it's not really we want to be beggars and, and hope that somebody's going to, uh, you know, give us compensation. We actually need to make that the structural transformation. Uh, and we're going to need, if we're going to do that, we're going to need to deploy industrial policy tools. We're going to need to insist on localization. We're going to need to insist on tariff support uh, and things like that. Now, I don't know what the conditionalities that attach to some of these, uh, these, 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 these loans are. I do know when I was in government, and we had an earlier program, uh, and I went to the European Development Bank in Luxembourg, and I tried to see whether they would provide uh, money. The condition was no localization. If you want to localize your inputs, don't come to us for money. I don't know whether that's still the case uh, or not, but I think that we, we need to understand these things. We also need to ensure that technology transfer is not impeded by exaggerated intellectual property regimes. That's the issue that cropped up with the COVID vaccines. We didn't win it in the WTO. We didn't win it. We didn't get a, a wave of any sort on the trips. We got something considerably watered down on that. But intellectual property regimes on technology at the moment, I think, are much more than a reward for innovation. They're a license for monopoly conduct at the moment. That's the point. And unilateral measures and private standards by are motivated as measures to promote an accelerated transition to net zero actually have enormous potential to be both unfair and to emerge as tools to exclude competitive imports from developing countries. That's the point I think we need to make. So they'll tell you that they're going to have CBAMs to ensure environmental sustainability and to sustain their net zero commitments. 
but it's got a huge potential to become a tool to exclude competitive imports. I'll come to that in a second now. So here I am on the, on the CBAMs. Carbon border adjustment measures. This is the EU's thing. Now, I think the CBAMs, um, they had the tactical good sense not to call them taxes. They used to be border adjustment taxes. A tax would actually be something that would be subject to litigation in the WTO. So it's now a measure. So how's this thing going to work? From next year, uh, all importers, and you can see they're going to pass this on to the suppliers, all importers will be, allowed, will be required to detail the emissions involved in any product in the following list, but the list is expandable. Aluminium, cement, electricity, fertilizers, iron and steel. They're going to have to report on this. And in 2026, anyone who is importing this above the uh, EU standard that they set for their own domestic market is going to have to, instead of paying a tax, you're going to have to buy a European trading system equivalent. You're going to have to engage in this carbon trading system, the private sector trading system. You have to buy an equivalent. So it's going to be effectively a tax, but it's not going to be a tax imposed by government. You're going to have to impose that. That list is expandable. I think if I understand it correctly, by 2031, they wanted to include all products. So um, I'm making the point that European Union uh, technical barriers to trade, including pesticide, food safety, and chemical regulations, have been imposed on the basis of debatable science and with the suspicion that the real uh, motive is to limit the entry of competitive imports. I want to make the, the example of South African citrus. The South African citrus industry is incredibly uh, competitive. And uh, so for many years, we have a battle with the EU over something called citrus black spot. It's a little fungus in the, in the peel. And I think the, the international science tells us this cannot be transferred to, it's, it's a no damage to human health. It can't be transferred to orchards from the peel, only from the leaf. And the leaf doesn't go with the orange or the, or the grapefruit or whatever it is. Uh, and, uh, but they, they, they insist. And the suspicion is that the real motive, and it's required huge investments in the South African industry to meet the standards. The real reason is to limit the inflow of competitive citrus against the demands of Spain. The same with chemicals and the same with other food safety. That's, that's a suspicion. And I think that these technical barriers to trade, which would now include climate related, could also be used in that way. But in any case, meeting those standards often requires large additional investments. I could see, for example, that the citrus industry in South Africa, you're going to be measured, you're, going to, you're using ESCOM power. Uh, is ESCOM power going to be renewable by 2031? Uh, if not, uh, are you going to have to buy a, a ETS equivalent? I think those are going to be the kind of issues uh, that we're going to face. So I think that these C-bands uh, are a unilateral measure that I think could have uh, which would which would challenge, I think, uh, um, our uh, ability to to, uh, to 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 you know operate and to achieve structural transformation. Then I think that although the EU and I'm going to wrap up, this is my last slide. The EU is followed by other developed countries. These unilateral measures. Uh, I'm just going to mention the WTO. Uh, there's a plurilateral process. It's the Joint Statement Initiative on Environmental Goods and Services. Uh, and among other things, it's proposing liberalization of environmental goods, no tariffs on environmental goods. So if you have input uh, uh, wind towers, whatever, whatever, they would uh, come in duty free. You wouldn't have any ability to use an industrial policy tool. Um, there is a, a suggestion to, in that group that, uh, that, that you should work with the existing trading system uh, rather than have a, a system of, of public standards uh, and that there should be more disciplines uh, 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 in, in, in particularly in, in any kind of uh, areas related to, uh, uh, to uh, carbon uh, um, uh, uh, measures, including uh, uh, high carbon agriculture. So I just say that I think the big challenge is can we develop the green industries and build the green, in green industry regional value chains? Can we defend ourselves against unfair trading practices of this sort? I think we need to be doing that. We need to be engaging in this area. 
can we better define and clarify our demands for resource transfers? Because otherwise, I think we're just going to find ourselves, uh, you know, um, apart from anything else, we will be increasing our debt denominated in foreign currency if we go this way. Uh, and uh, so I think that Africa needs its own initiatives. It also needs to struggle for its own version of a, gre a, a, a green deal that is global in character. So let me stop there. Thank you very much. This doesn't. Um, th thanks, Rob. I think that, that was a great input to, to kick off with in uh, identifying many of the, the, the key uh, policy issues uh, here in South Africa, continentally and uh, internationally. We'll go straight into uh, John's uh, presentation. Um, over to you, John. I just have to unmute. Can we assist uh, in the tech guys with? Um, Unmuting John and uh, maximizing him on the screen. Just hang on, John, we don't hear you yet. John, can you un unmute yourself? Okay, I think yeah, we'll hear you now. Go ahead. Good. We can okay. hear you. Thank you. Thank you so much uh, for the invitation. You can see the light fading outside uh, my dining room there that it's the end of the day in Sydney. So I'm very, uh, very grateful for the opportunity to come and participate in this uh, discussion with you. Uh, and to hear that uh, remarkable presentation from Dr. Davies on all of the problems, all of the barriers that are being uh, thrown up by the developed world to uh, the underdeveloped world looking to industrialize on the basis of green technology. My own paper uh, is uh, a conceptual piece on, the, uh, on the, the concept of the solar hydrogen economy. And I'm putting that forward as a model to guide the innovation uh, in, in energy systems uh, of the countries of the global south and countries in uh, particularly in Africa. And I just want to start by emphasizing that this is all relatively recent. It was only a short time ago that uh, there was a book published, The Hype About Hydrogen by Joseph Rom, in which he made the case that uh, all, all the uh, uh, prognostications about hydrogen were made by the fossil fuel uh, industries and all involved a continuation and extension of the life of fossil fuels. That's what he meant by the hype about hydrogen. Now, uh, the green hydrogen, it's the advent of green hydrogen that uh, makes all the difference. Uh, and that's, uh, that's what I, I would like to, uh, to focus on in my own talk. So a half century ago, the South African electrochemist, John O'Malley Brockris, invented the modern world. He formulated the concept of the hydrogen economy as a sustainable industrial system that could replace all fossil fuels and an industrial economy in their entirety. His motivation was to prevent anticipated runaway global warming and to reduce dependence on finite fossil fuel reserves, two issues that were then just emerging and which have only become more pressing in the intervening years. He called this system a solar hydrogen energy system where hydrogen is the core feature, what we now call green hydrogen. It would be produced by electrolysis of water, utilizing solar power, which encompasses wind power as well, uh, as a source of renewable power and channeling the green hydrogen as input into numerous industrial pathways to replace carbon-based inputs. For example, hydrogen steel, hydrogen cement, hydrogen aluminium, and various hydrogen chemicals particularly green ammonia as the basis of the global fertilizer industry, as well as hydrogen fuel cells for heavy transport like trains, buses, ships, and aircraft. The burning of hydrogen, burning in inverted commas, in all these pathways would produce nothing but water, thus creating a grand cycle, which starts with water and powers an entire industrial economy to produce water as the final product once again, round and round in an endless circular hydrogen economy. This ingenious and brilliant conception 
which had been intimated by the British scientist J.B.S. Haldane a half century earlier in 1923 in a lecture at Cambridge, is now finally coming to fruition as the world races to find a solution to climate change. Humanity is in a desperate struggle to create a post-fossil fuels economy as the only known means of avoiding terminal climate change induced by our profligate burning of fossil fuels in the 20th century. In the intervening half century since Bokra's work appeared in the 1970s, we've witnessed the concept of the solar hydrogen economy hijacked by the fossil fuels industry, pushing for brown hydrogen sourced from coal or gray hydrogen sourced from natural gas without carbon capture and storage, or blue hydrogen sourced from natural gas with carbon capture and storage, or for the nuclear industry pushing for pink hydrogen sourced from nuclear powered electrolysis of water. All these color coded options are all backward looking alternatives designed to extend the life of fossil fuels and nuclear fuels as compared with the future focused direct solar powered versions of the hydrogen economy, which is fundamentally green, safe and sustainable. Now, almost at a minute, minute to midnight, there is a serious green hydrogen industrial revolution underway. It starts with the production of hydrogen via electrolysis of water using renewable power. The hydrogen then follows multiple pathways such as production of green steel or green cement or powering of electrified transport. As the hydrogen is used, it joins with oxygen to recreate water in a grand planetary cycle that starts and ends with water, completely clean. So the fossil fuel economy, which is to be substituted by this, has grown to awesome size over the past century and a half. The countries that mastered fossil fuels through successive industrial revolutions, starting with coal and then proceeding through oil and then gas, opened up an enormous wealth gap between themselves and countries that were tied to traditional ways of doing things. Green hydrogen offers such countries a way to drive their own industrial revolution, to leapfrog, in other words. China offers a model of how to build a manufacturing-based industrial economy at scale. It's open to countries elsewhere in Africa, South America, or South Asia to pursue a similar model. The challenge is huge. The scale of the fossil fuel economy reach 12 billion tonnes of oil equivalent per year, or in energy terms, very close to 500 exajoules. By way of comparison, uh, an exajoule uh, is the energy released by a, a typical volcanic explosion. So the fossil fuel economy worldwide, 500 volcanoes. That's the way to think about how large it is. The equivalent total for green hydrogen is 4 billion tonnes or gigatons of hydrogen per year sourced from renewable power electrolysis. Governments and international agencies are bidding to take the lead in scaling up their efforts, while industrious like Andrew Twiggy Forrest in Australia or Mukesh Ambani in India and their companies are retrieving the original conception of the solar hydrogen economy as formulated originally by Bokris, bypassing fossil fuel and nuclear claims on our future. This emergent industrial revolution is tapping enormous renewable solar and wind resources for electrolysis of water at vast scale to power a comprehensive global green hydrogen industrial economy one that is relatively pollution free and devoid of carbon emissions, and one that can replace fossil fuels in their entirety, 100% substitution. Of course, the revolution is as yet in its infancy, but there are unmistakable signs that it is underway and propelled by drivers that promise far reaching outcomes. It's time to take the solar hydrogen economy seriously and plan for its imminent arrival. As Forrest himself says, there will be no bigger industry in the future than green hydrogen and ammonia. It will dwarf the scale of iron ore. It will dwarf the scale of coal. 
Forrest estimates the size of the green hydrogen industry to be 12 trillion US dollars by 2050, making it by far the largest industry on the planet. These are prescient remarks from an industrialist who has looked deeply at the emerging green hydrogen industry and plans to swing his company behind this fundamental new trend, creating a specialized vehicle for this project in the company Fortescue Future Industries. Now, the idea of a solar hydrogen economy extends well beyond its precursors in the form of renewable energies and circular commodity flows. Yes, renewables are needed as the source of energy in the form of the green hydrogen produced through electrolysis of water but then the green hydrogen can be stored or flow through the economy along multiple pathways to produce green steel or green cement for construction or green ammonia-based fertilizers for agriculture. In this way, the conception of the solar hydrogen economy extends well beyond that of the renewables themselves. And insofar as the hydrogen originates from water and returns to water, it encapsulates the essence of the circular economy. My object in this brief presentation is to give the sense that a green hydrogen transition is already underway and at a scale that it could conceivably substitute for fossil fuels in their entirety, provided the numerous obstacles being placed in its path can be circumvented. Transport, for example, offers an early indication of the green hydrogen transition, where electric vehicles promise to make a national transport systems independent of fossil fuels. The switch starts with electric cars, but promises to spread rapidly to electric heavy vehicles, trains, ferries, ships, aircraft. Already a competitive dynamic is clear in the issue of battery powered electric vehicles competing with fuel cell powered electric vehicles. Tesla represents the first option, green hydrogen the second. While early indications favour battery powered EVs, these offer smaller scale and range transport options, while fuel cell powered hydrogen come into their own as the scale of vehicle or vessel increases. Reliance on renewables based on solar cells and wind turbines and electrolyzers to produce green hydrogen, as well as batteries to store energy produced puts countries on a new industrial and energy footing. Gone is dependence on randomly distributed fossil fuel reserves and extraction activities such as mining and drilling to win energy. Instead, countries can manufacture their own devices and in effect, manufacture their own energy as China is demonstrably doing now. So the international political economy of the emergent green hydrogen economy is striking. The advanced industrial economies, which have led in all previous industrial transformations, stand to lose the lead to rising industrial powers like China and India and the emerging countries of Africa that are not tied to fossil fuel legacy systems. China in particular has now created the world's largest manufacturing system and the world's largest electrical power system to drive it. Recognizing the futility of trying to match industrial leaders in terms of fossil fuels, China and increasingly India is becoming a renewable superpower. The US leads in advancing fossil fuels such as through the shale oil revolution, but China leads the world in transitioning to a green electric power system sourced from water, wind and sun and surpassing 1 trillion watts of power sourced from WWS in 2021. We have the pictures now in the next slides of these industrial transformations. There in the red line, you can see China rapidly becoming the world's premier manufacturing power. The next slide showing the next slide, please, showing how China is building up its green electric power system, rapidly increasing every year its electric power system uh, in a green sense from water, wind and sun over the past several years. And in the final slide, uh, we can see how China 
by the year 2021 was already a renewable superpower with more than one trillion watts of power sourced from water, wind and sun. Given this trend, it can be anticipated that China, followed by India, is likely to lead the world in the transition to a green hydrogen economy, laying down a new infrastructure based on renewable power, circular flow economy and green hydrogen. As such, hydrogen, China can be anticipated to pioneer a new industrial system that surpasses fossil fuels, that leaves fossil fuels behind and relieves developing countries from all the energy and environmental and economic insecurities associated with fossil fuels. Countries in Africa stand to gain enormously by pursuing this new post-fossil fuels model. There is no reason for countries in Africa to pursue fossil fuels the way it was done by the countries, the, the industrial leaders. Of course, the transformation will not be overnight. It will take decades to complete. No genuine industrial revolution can be accomplished without involving multiple industrial pathways and technological choices, taking time to mature. But the beauty of the schema is that for every pathway involving green hydrogen, displacing fossil fuels, the solar hydrogen economy can, comes one step closer and the system based on fossil fuels correspondingly declines, thus bringing more momentum behind the transition. This is a concept that can be uh, characterized in economic terms as a chain reaction, to use the phrase introduced by uh, Nicholas Calder in 1970, or uh, circular and cumulative causation associated with the great development economist Gunnar Myrdal. So, Jonna, to, to finalise now, John O'Malley Bokras formulated his brilliant conception of the solar hydrogen economic system while working in an Australian university at the School of Physical Sciences at Flinders University in Adelaide. He published the ideas in a letter to science in 1972 and a book link in 1975. But he never lived to see the idea being taken up in earnest as it is today. It was visionaries like Bokris and before him Haldane who first saw in detail the miracle of hydrogen as a sustainable alternative and successor to fossil fuels in their entirety. What an extraordinary development that we as a civilization should have powered our way to wealth with the, through the discovery of fossil fuels and then having reached our present state of wealth but coming up against the impasse of global warming, that we should find a benign alternative that can act as successor to the fossil fuels economy. No one would have predicted this astonishing sequence of developments in advance of their recent appearance. To a time traveling observer from the 18th century, it would be quite incredible. Yet it falls to us in the 21st century to bring this sequence to fruition, and I'm putting it to you that it will be the developing countries that will actually lead the way. Thank you very much for your attention. Could I show you in the last three slides uh, the uh, sources of uh, my argument here? This is the article we published in Nature in 2014, where we make the case that renewables are actually the manufacture of energy. Then to the next slide, we have uh, my last book, The Global Green Shift in 2017. But I make the point that uh, I don't spend much time in that book uh, discussing hydrogen. I discuss renewable energies. And uh, the final slide is uh, the new book coming out this month in London at uh, Anthem Press a solar hydrogen economy. Thank you very much for your attention. Um, thanks, thanks very much, John. John. We're really glad you could join us uh, virtually all the way from Sydney. Um, Faisal, uh, you, you can go straight ahead. Uh, Pumzil is loading your presentation. Okay. Go ahead. Thank you very much. Uh, can you hear me? Yes, thanks. 
Thank you. Well, it's uh, it's really amazing to be speaking after two excellent uh, speakers. Uh, both uh, Rob Davies uh, <clears throat> has uh, really made the case uh, for uh, the transition to renewables um, and low carbon in uh, energy uh, uh, in, in, in Africa. And I think that the uh, presentation we just heard by, by John, John Matthews uh, really is a, is a great delight to listen to. Uh, I'm familiar with some of the issues he's raised, but he's just presented it in such a wonderful, comprehensive overview and uh, made such a convincing argument. So thank you so much to both of you for the, those presentations. So my uh, discussion is, uh, let me see if I put this up right. My presentation is really um, more about what I know a little bit more about, which is trade. Uh, and uh, I, I was recently in Geneva uh, speaking at the WTO public forum and uh, I uh, catching up with uh, what has been going on in the World Trade Organization. And I realized the huge gap uh, that exists between the trade negotiators in Geneva and the negotiators in the UNFCC. And I thought, uh, you know, we perhaps need to uh, try and see how we could bring these two uh, discussions together. <clears throat> and um, I thought I'd start um, by helping the negotiators to think a little bit about how to position the African continent in the debate about uh, climate change and our response to it and uh, how uh, Africa uh, can advance its interests in the global negotiations, which are of course taking place mainly in the UNFCC, but um, as I will show, the discussion is taking place everywhere uh, in the multilateral system and indeed um, at other levels in the region and at the national level. So how do we position the continent uh, in this discussion? Well, a good place to start is the uh, IPCC report. And uh, uh, you know the, uh, the last report, the sixth assessment report has an excellent chapter, chapter nine, which discusses the, um, uh, the situation of the continent and gives a, a really great presentation uh, of the existing research. And it makes uh, an excellent case that Africa has made the least contribution to greenhouse gas emissions, yet Africa is already suffering um, the greatest burden, uh, almost twice uh, the uh, uh, and extreme negative impacts of climate change are being felt on the continent in various ways. And I think most of you are aware of that. <clears throat> Uh, so I'm not going to go into it in any detail, but just uh, to kind of set out the argument that um, African countries are beginning to make um, in, in, uh, in the UNFCC, uh, <clears throat> but also in, in the WTO. Uh, <clears throat> so the report argues that um, the impact um, of GAG emissions uh, is uh, highly significant on the African continent. We indeed, we have felt it. And uh, uh, I know just in my hometown, uh, Durban, uh, last, uh, just this year, uh, we have had massive floods. Um, and uh, across the African continent, uh, we have seen and experienced um, the uh, cyclones, uh, extreme temperatures, uh, drought, uh, locusts, and a range of other uh, negative impacts, which have caused um, uh, setbacks in Africa's development. Um, and so African countries are arguing that um, they should be given carbon credits. And this means that for uh, the, <clears throat> they should be compensated for um, having not used up the opportunity to industrialize and to develop their infrastructure as uh, the developed countries have done um, and that uh, they have in any event have had to suffer negative impacts 
and this should be taken into account. And um, as a start, uh, these credits could be used for debt relief. Um, as we know, African countries have also been negatively impacted uh, by accumulation of crisis, starting with uh, COVID, um, uh, well, the, the, um, the recession, then COVID, and now um, increased uh, climate uh, impacts. Um, so climate change, uh, we have seen the, the, the impacts uh, across the African continent and uh, African countries are being asked uh, to uh, uh, shift to a low carbon. And we have uh, indeed uh, begun to see the, um, uh, the, the uh, challenges that uh, these countries have had to uh, begin to make to uh, transition uh, to from coal-based to uh, uh, carbon-based energy towards more renewable energy. Um, and they have been demanding uh, that they be assisted through, um, because they have to support uh, workers and communities that are negatively impacted uh, by this transition to a low carbon energy. And so there's been a, a demand for uh, just energy transition uh, in uh, many countries like South Africa. Um, now, why is it that um, African countries uh, should be uh, asking for carbon credits and for compensation. And so I have just uh, listed a, a few reasons uh, for this. Um, and uh, I think these are some of the arguments that African countries uh, could be making um, to support their argument that they need to be given uh, carbon credits and they should be compensated for uh, the uh, the damage that is being caused, the loss and damage that is being caused to their economies. So how should um, African countries turn these uh, challenges um, of climate change uh, into opportunities for development? And I'm pleased that both the speakers before have already made the case that um, we should be looking at these uh, challenges as opportunities for development and indeed uh, they are great opportunities for the continent. So I want to discuss this, uh, uh, these opportunities uh, at the national level, at the regional level and the, and the global level. And I want to argue that um, uh, Africa should be advancing the uh, a strategy for um, a development, which I call climate resilient development. And uh, this is a concept that uh, has been discussed in the IPCC report. Um, so uh, a lot of the, the focus um, in, the, in the last year uh, here in South Africa, but in, in other developing countries too, where this transition is beginning to take place is on what they call the just energy transition. And this focus is, is legitimate and is correct, uh, but it does um, you know, narrow the focus to um, the transition um, in uh, um, energy and um, uh, it's focused on one of the aspects of uh, climate change, which is mitigation. And uh, I think I want to argue that um, we need to think beyond mitigation because perhaps the greater trans transitional costs for developing countries and Africa is in adaptation both in their uh, agriculture where extreme temperatures are causing uh, the, the need for uh, uh, adaptation of technologies and different forms of, uh, of, of uh, production, but also in manufacturing where um, the changes in consumer demand around the world and we've just heard in uh, textiles, for example, and apparel uh, will cause um, uh, changes in production and it will require the need for uh, transitions to, to take place and adaptation uh, in, in uh, developing countries and in Africa. <laughs> and of course, um, the, the impact of the floods and other such uh, disasters um, has focused uh, on the need for more resilient infrastructure. So uh, mitigation, adaptation and uh, resilience are all important uh, pathways and important strategies for 
Africa to focus on. And therefore the concept of climate resilient development, which includes all three of these aspects are uh, quite important. And therefore I argue in a paper I've just written that Africa should be mainstreaming climate resilient development into its national development strategy. So uh, we should be, in other words, um, uh, building uh, a, a comprehensive response to climate change across all sectors of the um, economy um, and uh, we should be mainstreaming this. So there are uh, <clears throat> several uh, pathways uh, where uh, climate resilient development uh, should be uh, advanced. Um, and on the African continent, this could be done uh, and has to be done um, in energy where Africa is uh, still um, uh, at, the, at the average level of energy um, uh, access is about 40% with some countries um, uh, as low as 11%, if you, if you think of the case of Malawi. And so we need to both increase our uh, infrastructure in energy, but we also need to transition in those areas where um, uh, we already are uh, heavily reliant on fossil fuels. And as Rob Davis has already argued, uh, we need to do this in a way which also uh, uh, supports and stimulates industrialization so that we're not locked in to becoming once more dependent on the technologies for these renewable energy um, uh, 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 transformations um, from the north uh, or from China and other countries. And secondly, of course, the other pathway we, uh, where a, a massive uh, transition must take place is in agriculture. Um, to ensure that uh, we have food security. And, uh, and then as I've argued in um, uh, infrastructure. And one of the key issues in infrastructure is the need to strengthen Africa's uh, development finance institutions, because as Rob Davies has argued, that whilst we have legitimate demands um, to uh, require and to request um, support um, for uh, genuine climate finance, which results in uh, net transfers, this is not likely to happen on a large scale. And therefore, Africa will need to mobilize its own, it, it will have to develop its own capacity, its own institutions to mobilize finance for its development. So <clears throat> how can we do this at the regional level? Uh, so in a book that I wrote last year, I call for um, the AFCFTA to adopt an approach called developmental regionalism. Of course, I built on uh, research that had been done in the uh, United Nations, in UNCTAD, and also in work uh, that Rob Davies has done in the past, arguing that um, we should not simply rely on trade liberalization to um, stimulate uh, industrialization um, in, uh, on the African, uh, or to stimulate regional integration uh, on the African continent, but we should think about regional integration on the African continent in a more comprehensive way. And we should simultaneously, as we liberalize, as we open markets in Africa to create a bigger market for investors, we should also stimulate industrialization so that we build regional value chains supporting each other, cooperating with each other to build our competitiveness on the African continent. And we're going to need uh, to also uh, work together to cooperate, uh, to build our infrastructure <clears throat> uh, to ensure that uh, we're able to uh, trade more efficiently across the African continent. So I call this um, developmental regionalism and uh, as we, we need to now ensure that we um, also mainstream uh, climate change into national development, uh, we need to do this at the regional level. And so I call for a climate resilient developmental regionalism. So a more comprehensive uh, developmental pathway. And John Matthews makes a compelling case for Africa to, um, uh, uh, to leapfrog 
uh, to be in advance of other countries because uh, many of them in the north, uh, like the United States, are locked in to uh, fossil fuel uh, to, um, uh, uh, energy systems and, and infrastructure. And Africa, with such a low level of, um, of energy infrastructure uh, and with low levels of industrialization, is well positioned to leapfrog and to enter into um, uh, or drive its industrialization process um, with low carbon uh, energies uh, and uh, to do this in a way which supports its uh, developmental pathways um, and to adapt, to build greater resilience. And that's why I call this climate resilient developmental regionalism. So in the concept of developmental regionalism that I have put forward in my book, I've called for this to happen in a way uh, which is fair, we, in other words, which spreads the benefits of freer trade for all the countries on the African continent. It means the larger countries must be willing to make a bigger contribution. They must be more sensitive to the plight of smaller countries on the African continent. And uh, the private sector too should um, not just uh, export uh, goods and services across the African continent, it should uh, support a supplier development in the countries where it, uh, uh, it uh, hosts its uh, production um, and uh, work in, in, in partnership with uh, uh, countries where it locates. And secondly, the possibilities for regional value chains should be exploited. And uh, we've identified a number of opportunities like in the cotton textiles, a paddle pipeline, but also in a, a number of agricultural sectors uh, there's a huge potential for Africa to work together, to cooperate, to build these value chains across the African continent. Uh, and indeed, in, uh, in infrastructure, there are already uh, processes underway to build um, uh, road, rail, uh, corridors, uh, and port corridors, uh, like the Mombasa, um, uh, Nairobi uh, corridor, the North-South corridor, the corridor that's been built in, in West Africa from, um, from uh, Lagos uh, to, uh, 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 across to Cote d'Ivoire. Uh, so you have uh, these processes that are underway. And if we could um, <clears throat> begin to ensure that in the way in which these corridors are built, um, we, uh, uh, we, we build uh, uh, green value chains and green corridors uh, that support uh, a low carbon uh, economy. And I argue in my book too that uh, these processes must be supported by uh, a, a greater uh, focus on strengthening uh, governance, um, because without governance, development will not succeed. So um, what happens at the global level? At the global level, we need to ensure that uh, there is a, uh, we close the gap between divergent, somewhat divergent discussions and, and that, that are moving in different parts of the multilateral system. Uh, people in the UNFCC are not really engaging with Geneva and the WTO people really are not connected to the discourse taking place in the UNFCC. And indeed the discussion about this uh, transition is taking place in many other parts of the United Nations um, and, uh, and the global multilateral system in the G20. Um, uh, the issues related to finance are being discussed, uh, but the negotiators are not really talking to each other. So I make a case in the paper I've written for greater coordination between uh, different parts of the global system and uh, for Africa to play a role in arguing for a common discourse, a common narrative um, that should be um, argued across the multilateral system. And indeed, um, for um, a more innovative global uh, governance architecture uh, that um, is able to focus on the systemic um, challenge of climate change. And uh, that means we need to adapt the current global multilateral system to address this new systemic challenge that the whole world is beginning to face. And so I put forward a number of principles and Rob Davies has already spoken to most of these, so I'm not going to repeat them. And except to 
uh, argue that um, uh, what we should be all working for is a global Green New Deal as has been put forward by UNCTAD. And this means that we need to begin to fashion a new global architecture with new principles uh, and norms, which are based on sustainability, on justice, uh, on equity, and uh, which have uh, mutual respect for the diff different development pathways uh, of diversity in our uh, development pathways and the, the policy space um, should be uh, uh, provided for uh, in the rulemaking that takes place uh, uh, in, in global multilateral fora, especially in the WTO, because there is a tendency for the WTO to restrain policy space of, uh, for developing countries. Um, and uh, I argue that um, uh, as the Global Green New Deal principles have been, argue, uh, have been put forward in Geneva, uh, these are a good basis for us to begin to forge a new pathway forward. So this is really uh, uh, a, a presentation of a narrative, um, a set of arguments for developing countries to be arguing and for Africa to be arguing in the current debate about uh, the path forward on um, climate change. Thank you very much.